and welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Danny Cannell. That's Bud Elliott. I'm Chip Patterson. It's time to open up that big old bag of mail. Your questions, our answers, and of course, if you want to get in on a future mailbag episode, you can do so by going on over to those reviews. Leave us a five-star review, and in the review, put your question. Uh, We love uh, all of the feedback that we've got there, and remember... Hey, listen, if you just jump in my Twitter mentions and tell me how angry you are that your team did not get mentioned on the group of five or independent spring gleaning podcast, that's that's not going to get any response from me. But if you get in the mention, if you get in the reviews and you leave a five star review and you say, hey, I would like an app state spring gleaning. Then, hey, you know what? If you do that, we'll give you an upcoming Spring Gleaning App State segment on a future mailbag episode. But if you just come chirping at me talking about how you think that some third-year coach is overrated and we focused on the wrong Sunbelt power, that's not going to do it. Leave a five-star review, then, you know, maybe we'll come back and we'll be talking about them nears. Um, if you and a buddy leave a five star review, like if we get a couple App State fans to leave five star reviews, or you know, a couple, I don't know what team we left out of, of the spring gleaning, but like, you know, there, there's there's power in numbers, y'all. Uh, <laughs> we tell got, a friend. Yeah, we've tell a friend. We do have uh, App State listeners that have gotten in on mailbags before, so I know y'all are out there. And uh, and the more the more that come, the uh, the faster we'll uh, we'll we'll get around to it. Um, before we dive into the big old bag of mail, we continue to follow the um, the back and forth of Eric Gilbert, the former five star prospect coming out of high school, uh, tight end, stepped into LSU in the absence of Thaddeus Moss. We're thinking, boom, this is going to be uh, an instant opportunity. He's going to see the field, and he did. But he also decided that LSU was not for him. Transferred to Florida but then didn't ever join the football program at Florida, reopened his recruitment. And we've got a comment from Ed Odron who says that he had a quote, very positive meeting in Baton Rouge with Eric Gilbert over his future at LSU. Now the initial, uh, my initial read was that Eric Gilbert wanted to be closer to home and he's from Georgia. And I guess technically Gainesville is closer to home than Baton Rouge. Now, uh, not not quite sure where we're thinking here. I, if he returns, then it's like an immense talent. It is somebody who can uh, be who has a, a potential, you know, NFL draft ceiling in terms of his rating coming out of high school. And LSU, while it does have great skill position talent, would more than happily welcome him back into the program. As we're, uh, you know. Are, are boots on the ground, bud? You know, what's our, what's our general read about Gilbert? Do we think that he ends up back with the Tigers uh, at some point during this offseason? I, I think just the fact that he had the meeting with, with Orgeron and, and that Orgeron was publicly commenting on it and, and saying, you know, good things. They're, they're trying to support uh, Arik Gilbert right now uh, through whatever he's he's going through. Um, you know, if I had to pick like a four-year university for him to play at in the fall, I guess I would pick LSU at this point since he didn't actually enroll – at Florida. Um, but like, you know, there's also like, will he have to go Juco? Who, who knows? Uh, I I'm not really sure, you know, where he'll end up. I, I, I hope the best for him. I, I always enjoyed interviewing him when I was talking to him at like the all American game and whatnot. So he's talent wise. There's no doubt, man. You just gotta, gotta keep it together enough to stay on the field. You guys remember the Aaliyah song back, back, Back and forth. Remember that song with R. Kelly? Oh, yeah. That was great. Oh, that was a great mix, too, man. Uh, that's what you're seeing. I I don't some of these, you know, you're talking about decisions made by 18, 19, 20-year-olds. They're gonna make rash decisions a lot of times. Um, I don't know the specifics of what's going on behind the scenes. I wouldn't I like at this point, like reliability is a big thing, accountability, being available. I have no idea if, if arms or excuse me, Gilbert is going to be available anywhere. So I, I don't like until I get a definitive from LSU, from Florida, or from Gilbert himself saying this is where I'm going to be. I think all we're doing is speculating about a complete unknown. So I have no idea what's going to happen. Incredibly talented player. And when he was going to Florida and it, everything seemed to be, hey, on track, he's ready to go. It's like, okay, this could be another Kyle Pitts type situation that can take over games. 
But since now it's up in the air, I just have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, it was like Gilbert and Demarcus Bowman's commitments had kind of like paired up to have a lot of off-season momentum uh, around the Gators. Not that there is any less necessarily, and certainly the injury to George Pickens opens up, in my mind, uh, a little bit more of a debate. If you liked Georgia over Florida and – you know, you lose George Pickens, but then you lose Arik Gilbert, then, you know, they're, they're probably still right there neck and neck. And, and as we all know, I mean, that, that game's good. That, that division will be decided by one game. And, uh, and we'll see who ends up winning it. All right, let's open up the big old bag of mail. Uh, we begin with a question from Shaq Tonio. Oh, and it says, love the pod, guys. Started listening right before the pandemic and have been shocked that I wasn't listening sooner. Amazing college football analysis with minimal hot takes for the sake of it. We have hot takes, but they are not just for the sake of it. Huge Knowles fans so adding Bud took the show over the roof because I've listened to the Knoll cast forever as well. But I have a question about the evolution of offensive line play and more importantly, scouting. Compared to when I first started watching football, late 90s, to now, almost every position is much more athletic and at most times 15 to 20 pounds lighter on average than from those times. A 250-pound linebacker in the year 2001 plays D-line now. A 225-pound safety, then, a 225-pound safety from then plays linebacker now. Quarterbacks are sub six feet tall and considered five-star high school prospects and going first overall in the NFL draft. This used to be blasphemy. All positions, but offensive line. Offensive line is just as big and seemingly haven't had to change body types in the same way to be successful despite their direct adversary in edge players being smaller and faster now. My question is, When will a different body type succeed for offensive line? Will it ever? Will there ever be a 6'4", 275 guys playing left tackle and being able to fully match athleticism with edge players as opposed opposed to the 6'5", 335-pound player that I see now? Thanks for any take or insight into this. So I I, I think he's on to something that a lot of positions are – you know, l- lighter now, right? But but they're they're trying to accomplish different goals. So on offense, you're trying to isolate people in space y- using your quickness. A lot of times, right? Get the ball and get get the ball to a guy in stride in space. There's a good chance he, he you know he can go the distance. Defenses, particularly in the back seven, have had to you know a- adjust to counter that, right? With you know guys who can move a little bit better. I'll give you an example. We just put out our class of 2023 rankings at 24/7 Sports. And Malik Bryant is a player uh, at IMG Academy, who I'm going to see uh, next week, actually. And he is just shy of 6'2", and he's 235 pounds in you know, the spring of his sophomore year. He still has two more years in, in high school. We've classified him as an edge defender, even though you know right now he plays a lot of linebacker. But that's just a projection, right? Unless he just doesn't grow at all, we think he's going to play you know, on, on the edge because nowadays you have to be so much better at coverage from the linebacker position than than you used to the issue is that nobody's trying to isolate offensive linemen in space right like they're not trying to pick on them in space for the most part and i guarantee you defenses on the defensive line are bigger now than they were you know 10 or 20 years ago for the most part with the one exception being you know teams play more you know five and six defensive back sets and you don't have the guys that are like 360 anymore as much because of, of, of the up-tempo stuff and, you know, the shifting needs for a defense. For instance, you, you know, run defense used to be more important relative to pass defense than it is now. Why? Well, A, we grew up thinking that way. B, teams used to run the ball a lot more than they do now. So now the value of these really big defensive linemen is not what it, you know, what it once was because pass rushing – is more uh, more emphasized and more important on a down to down basis, and generally the, the huge guys aren't that great at that. From a scouting perspective, I will say that we are very skeptical of the dudes who are you know over three hundred, especially in that like three fifteen, three twenty range, as underclassmen in high school. We often look at that and think too big, too fast, right? Lost athleticism. A lot of that's not good weight. 
these programs, I can pretty much guarantee you, for the most part, do not want these guys that are that big that early in high school, right? They'd rather have you be like 260 at the end of your sophomore year, 250, and then, you know, put on 10, 15 pounds when you're 16, 10, 15 when you're 17, get to college, couple shy, 300. They'll, they'll take it from there, put on some good weight on you. I do think how we've scouted that, you know, changes some because of, of the uh, improvements in nutrition and, and weightlifting at some of these schools. There are still some schools, though, that do a pretty good job of taking kids who are heavy uh, and thinking they can unlock athleticism by cutting weight off them. I would actually look at Florida. I think John Hevesy there does a really nice job, perhaps exploiting a market inefficiency in the process of, uh, I, I guess I'm rambling here, but like he, he takes guys that are real heavy and you're like, look, look at Ethan White, who's, who's a good offensive lineman now for Florida. I mean, they cut probably what, 60 pounds off him since he enrolled. Uh, so there are some inefficiencies to exploit in that process as well. Uh, I think it's interesting because I think the offensive line position has evolved, but it's in the, and it's not the body type because yeah, they're getting bigger and they are getting faster, but they're still bigger guys, but the athleticism of what they can do like a Tristan Wirfs who comes out last year, gets drafted in the first round and he's dunking basketball at six, five, three twenty, and doing pretty much whatever dunk you want him to do. Like that kind of stuff didn't happen 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, they are getting bigger. Again, Kai Becton, I saw him in Indianapolis and was like, this guy is ginormous. And I had played alongside some really big dudes, but he was up there at 6'7", 370. And it was kind of all like, man, it must probably might've been a little light day. Like, I think he's even bigger than that. Um, so I think the, the position is evolving to a place where they're having to match athleticism, but you still have the size that's there. Um, and then, of course, there's outliers on them. I don't, are we answering the question pr- correctly, Chip? Do you think we're like trying to think if we're answering the question correctly? Like, is there is it can it evolve as far as he's it thinking was, smaller? Yeah, the, I think the idea was uh, like the the heights and weights haven't changed on the offensive line. So right. do we so see, then that so the athleticism go- has changed. Correct. That's, that's what I'm saying. So yeah, the heights and weights, I think they are slightly bigger and slightly taller, but they're way more athletic. I right. think and it's just kind I mean, of the evolution that, of that. Well, I mean, and that's, and that also like, I mean, like you were mentioning, bud, like strength coaches are smarter. They're better about health. They're better about flexibility and like being able to make sure that you can carry and move that weight at that height, at that frame in ways that are different than the guy who, you know, he's just always been big, you know, right? right? And he's he's always just been a people mover. It's like, no, now, now we want to make sure you, you can be that big and you can pull around and, and make a block on a defensive back out in space kind of stuff. And, and I will say, like, not every kid who is that big, that young, turns out to be a bust, right? I mean, I, I'll, I'll think specifically of Evan Neal, who I think he starts at Alabama, started Alabama for multiple years now. I think he was like 370 at that opening camp down, down there in Miami uh, before his senior season. And yet his testing numbers were real, really good, and he moved really well. Like, oh, okay, this is, this is different. We don't see 370 from a high school kid who can move. Now, 370 was still too heavy, and Bama since cut him down, you know, probably 20, 20-ish pounds. But for the most part, yeah, we are looking for athleticism. I, I think it's interesting, though, like does size help with your pass protection on the interior? right? Like you would think you'd want to have the guys who can move, get in front of these pass rushers, but anchoring is also really important. Not, not having the pocket push back into your face. And when I think about the schools that use really small athletic linemen, typically they're the schools that want to pull guards a whole lot. They they run a lot of trap stuff. They're, they're running a lot of option type concepts, you know, with the game going more and more pass heavy. I mean, Mike Leach always had really big guys and really big splits, right? And just, you know, basically if they run into you, they're stopped to try to go around you, just push them. You know, with the huge splits, you don't have enough time to to run run that edge and and and, uh, and get there. That's uh, that's a good point because uh, the reason why the military academies all pull and get their linemen out in space is because they're not big enough to be able to take a straight on pass rush. Like they, the pocket would collapse, right? And they cut the crap out of them too, which kind of eliminates any size advantage or disadvantage you might have. Truth, truth. <laughs> all right. This next question comes from Mark. This is by far the best college football podcast there is. Very entertaining, and the hosts are extremely knowledgeable. I have a question for the mailbag I'd like to submit. We all know Nick Saban is the greatest college football coach of all time. 
Being truly honest, I don't see him as a great in-game coach anymore. He is clearly the best program culture builder and does a tremendous job keeping his team focused and ready to play each week. That being said, who do you e- who do each of you think are the two to three best in-game coaches of all time? Now, Mark, I'm a, I'm a just going to say right now, I think Nick Saban is a damn good in-game coach. I think Nick Saban does a fantastic job of identifying on a, a biggest stage against some of the best teams when something isn't working and when you can't get stops and what you need to do. And all I have to point to on the biggest stage is the onside kick against Clemson. I mean, he just said, we can't stop Deshaun Watson. He, and he knew, and that was a smart decision. He said, the only way we're going to win this game is if we steal a possession and he and the special teams, uh, the, spe- the special team staff, I forgot who was special teams coordinator at that time on that team, but they had scouted Clemson all season long. And they said, this little space on the field is going to be open. And uh, was it, was it Kenyon Drake? I don't remember who caught it, but it was like a, a starter, a stud who they just mm. sent down the sideline, perfectly executed onside kick. And that onside kick ended up being uh, one of the differences in Alabama winning that national championship game against Clemson. We can go to putting in Tua at halftime of the national championship game against Georgia. I, I kind of feel like when it comes to in-game adjustments, the – the losses that uh, Nick Saban has on his resume, it, and they are very, very few during his time at Alabama, many, many of them are from circumstances that are outside of the realm of in-game coaching. I think Saban is a tremendous in-game coach, but uh, I, I don't know if I'm standing alone on that one. No, I think you're on to something. I think he gets way too much credit for benching Jalen Hurts, though, and going to Tua. It was bad. I'm, I got crushed because I came out and said, how do you bench Jalen Hurts? All he did was, you know, SEC player of the year. I think he had 17 touchdowns and one interception. How do you take him out? But yet I got a text message with a buddy of mine. I'm like, there's no way they're winning this game unless they bench uh, Jalen Hurts. Like I had a text exchange, but I didn't think he would do it. But it was that bad. Like it was so obvious that you had to do something to spark the team. But I don't... I think you gave some great examples too. The onside call was a great one. Um, I wouldn't say it's hard to tell because when I go to in-game coaches, I'm obviously as a quarterback, I go to offensive game, you know, that type of situation. Who's play calling the best? When do you dial up a certain protection? When do you make adjustments in game? But I think Nick Saban is clear. And how many times do you say, oh, Nick Saban with a month to prepare. So he's great at getting the team ready to go and game planning and sk- scouting and finding deficiencies in your team and a lot of times he doesn't need to do much in game and I think as he's gotten older I think he's probably trusted his staff more and delegated more and in fact with the offensive side of the ball the more he's let go of the offense the better it's become Um, but I wouldn't say it's I think he's got to be up there in the top coaches and in game. I don't think it's a deficiency for him by any means or he's just average I mean he's one of the greatest coaches we've ever seen he's doing something right yeah, I definitely think he's a good in-game coach. I, it is a little bit tough for me to separate, like, who's a great in-game coach themselves versus, you know, who has an awesome in-game staff and an army of analysts through the week. And, and obviously, if you have all those resources, you're probably uh, – if you're not better, you, I think you sort of stand out, right? Um, you, know, you look at, like Danny said, adjustments, timeout usage, understanding sort of – like sometimes there's value in extending the game but other times there's value in trying to win the game right now, right? Like this is our window to win this. Like extending this game is actually not going to, going to help us. It'll make it look close. It'll make it easier for me to answer questions with, with the media afterwards because we kept it close. But like if the actual chance to win it uh, is is right now. And I, I think, you know, a coach who does all those things pretty well uh, actually is Dan Mullen, right? Yeah. I, I think the I in-game can. adjustments he makes are really good. You, you, you can see – okay, look, they ran that earlier and now they just made, made this little tweak to it and boom, now, now it's wide open. I think he has become much more aggressive than he used to be. I, I thought they had a real chance to beat Alabama back when he was at Mississippi State. And to be honest, I thought Mullen kind of botched it by, by punting the ball multiple times in Bama territory. It's like, man, you what, 20 points ain't going to do it, man. Like you got you to score on one of these drives where you're already in Bama territory and you're probably not going to get the ball back in the back of Bama ter- 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 territory God, that many times. I think he's really good. Also, I mean, 
do you give Davos 20 credit for the adjustments that Venables makes? Because Venables' in-game adjustments are, are pretty insane. Maybe it's sign stealing, maybe it's not, but like it still works. <laughs> so I had uh I had Davo down here uh as like a mix because number one, hey, he's a he's a he's a middle eight uh preacher, you know, like he is all about that last four of the second quarter, first four of the third quarter, uses his timeouts, like you mentioned, and tries to really set it up to maximize the scoring opportunities and the uh, chances to get stops during that period, which, uh, you know, analytics has proven. And, and Clemson, even in its own game notes, brags about its record over the middle eight over the last several years. However, Dabo also does some head scratchers, right? Like there's some, uh, there's, there's maybe some field goals, calls, or, or maybe there's there's a few things along the way that that sometimes give me some head scratchers. But overall, I didn't have him as one of my top two or three, but I do think that Dabo, because of his understanding of specifically the key points in the game where we need to score, I, I had him as a plus value uh, in-game coach. You know who I've got? A, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Chip. I was, I was going to say, I have more come around – on like I used to be down on James Franklin as an in-game coach and I don't necessarily move him over into the certainly not in this top because two the zone read a couple of years ago against Ohio State notably I mean bro uh, and like, like four or whatever it was in like uses of timeouts near the ends of games early in his Penn State career I think that there have been less head scratchers there so I no longer consider him uh value loss um again not top two or three but not value loss and I'm not all the way coming around on Mario Cristobal, but that was another early in the career. You were just like, what, what are we doing here, bud? And, uh, and, and I think that I've at least seen enough evidence since then where Oregon's been in, uh, I mean, the Auburn game wasn't great. Uh, I've, I've at least seen some evidence uh, since then that maybe he is not value loss in that area and shocker, maybe some experience, you know, being, being in that spot uh, in those big situations has really helped. I would probably add Chip Kelly to this. I, I like. I, I don't think the talent he has at UCLA is, is all that great, and I, I think he does some things where he. I think he kind of understands like that. Our chance to win is to win now. Like the, he's not trying to to lose games close, right? He's trying to actually, you know, win the game. And I don't think it bothers him that much if they get blown out when their chance to win is now. They go for it and it doesn't. You know, it doesn't hit. Uh, from a betting perspective, I love Jimbo Fisher as a dog because the way he calls games is exactly des- <laughs> like it, it's designed to keep going to get close. that cover. Yeah. Now as a favorite, he's terrible, right? Because like they don't play to blow teams out. It does set them up. Like it's like, how does he lose all these ACC teams that, you know, just for no reason you should lose to and you have that much talent. Well, if you play, if you play a game that only has eight possessions in it, cause you take, you know, all 40 seconds, each play clock, uh, you can do that. But as a dog, when he's outgunned, I think he's a really creative, good coach understands how to, how to keep games really close. What was the Texas A&M Clemson? I think it was in Clemson, and it was like 16 nothing the whole game. The spread, I think, was right around 16. It was right about maybe two times. It was something around there. And Texas A&M went on like a 90-play, eight-minute drive to finish the game to cover. and But it didn't even come close to winning the game. And it really wasn't fast enough to get them another possession, but it was just a long scoring drive to get that backdoor cover. It was genius, though. They weren't going to yeah. beat Clemson. I think he probably knew they weren't going to beat Clemson. But it, like as a recruiting pitch, you can say, look, we played Clemson close. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you only have one possession each, we're actually going to lose by a 7 nothing. Yep. Okay, so I had one left on here. Gary Patterson. Am I hanging too much on that game? Do you all know the game I'm talking about? Gary Patterson changes his shirt at halftime. The comeback, the turtleneck, the turtleneck yeah. switch. <laughs> yes. Is the in-game adjustment switching it out. Uh, TCU in that game trailed 31 nothing at halftime in, in the Alamo Bowl against Oregon. Was playing without Travon Boykin because Travon Boykin had gotten in a fight at the hotel bar, if I remember correctly. It was a hotel bar? or was It was a bar oh, in man. town okay. at the bowl game. Okay. Yeah. I do not know if it was the team hotel bar, uh, but again, we were in uh, we were in San Antonio. So isn't pretty much everything just uh, pretty know, much yeah like all all tourist walk. driven all on the Riverwalk. Yeah, TCU comes back from that thirty one nothing deficit uh, without its starting quarterback wins forty seven to forty one. Whether or not, and of course, we consider Gary Patterson to be a general good game planner. So 
always in my mind as a, uh, as, as a good in-game coach for that one. Do you know that game? And it's funny because I get associated with turtlenecks frequently <laughs> because I wore one on the air at ESPN. Oh, not one. Terrific. You embraced it. Well, as no, I did. Well, so, yeah, but yeah. the first time that I wore it was that Saturday. I was in all day long from noon until 2 a.m. with Galloway and Adnan Verk, and we're doing, and they're like abusing me because I think the first game was like so so. And like, I think Adnan like tried to get a question on the game, and Galloway like stopped the conversation. He's like, hold on a second. He's like, are we going to not address this turtleneck like that he's wearing? So he kind of brought attention to it. And then I was able to flip it back because I was talking about the beauty and the power and the charm and the magic of wearing a turtleneck when he switched out. I think it was more of a mock neck that he switched to, but it still did the trick for sure. But then from then on, I did a brace, but that was the first time I wore it out there. Now look how many people are doing it. It's way more comfortable. It's way more practical. All right. So the uh, episode title, the origin of Danny's turtleneck brand. Yes. <laughs> Goes back to that Saturday, bowl week, bowl weekend of, you know, like the, the, the bowl season, bowl mania. It was right then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Feast, feast week, bowl mania, you know how it goes. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, the January 2nd, 2016, end of the 2015 season. Uh, yeah. Big day. All right. Huge. The 2021 Masters is underway. You know, Dustin Johnson set a record for a Masters winner with only four bogeys in his win in November. Whew. Then he got out there on T. Olive on that par four first. That approach shot ran a little long. Green's real fast and firm. He's chipped back, went about 30 feet past the hole. Four bogeys, 72 holes in November. One hole, one bogey. DJ, he's out underway. And the First Cut podcast, as you covered with round-by-round round coverage after every tournament day, Rick Gaiman, Kyle Porter, who's in Augusta, and the rest of the First Cut crew are breaking down the odds board every night and bringing you analysis from the grounds at Augusta National. Go join the First Cut podcast, available wherever you're listening to this podcast. Keep it with CBS Sports HQ for updates at the top of every hour. Uh, I'll be on there frequently. Rick Gaming, Kyle Porter will be on there frequently. And of course, you can see featured groups on the range, uh, Amen Corner, Hole 15, 16, and the broadcast all available on Paramount+. Plus. So First Cut Podcast for daily round-by-round -round breakdowns and looks at the odds board, CBS Sports HQ all through the day, and you can stream the Masters on CBSSports.com, the CBS Sports mobile app, or on Paramount Plus. Coming up on the other side, we're talking a lot about name, image, and likeness and what it might mean for college players. But what about looking beyond that in terms of some of the opportunities that might be there since we we start to learn about these guys even before they show up to college? Got a good question about that and more next. Next question, B-Rabbit back in the house. He says, gentlemen, Keep up the phenomenal work. It's a privilege to listen to this well-oiled machine week in and week out. Well, wish it never ends. Wish it never ends. Shout out Blink-182. If NIL ever kicks in, will elite high school players, ones with thousands, sometimes 100,000 views of their highlight reels, solely post their film on YouTube or other sites that will pay the player for their high number of views, versus sites that can't or won't pay the player for their high view count. Will all high school players eventually follow suit? Do you think that the player's high school would be able to cash in? It's one immediate thing I can think of for a high school player to monetize their own play on the field. Will high schoolers have the foresight while still in high school to post on sites where they can get paid for views in the event that they could become a household name in college, causing views of their old high school film to skyrocket? Moreover, will that become a way for college and universities to indirectly provide income to a prospect before they sign with the program by promoting, parentheses, without direct communication, highlight films on pay sites with a simple retweet from university and or coaches' accounts? P.S. What do you think of the Florida Gators sponsored by Lacoste, or is that too obvious? <laughs> That's a good too one. Too obvious, right? Yeah, too obvious, but okay. I like it. So this like huddle is free. Like, I don't think we're ever going to have huddle paying players per view. Right. So. All right. Let's answer this question with a question. Okay. Why don't NFL players 
post their own highlights and, and, and monetize it. They don't own them. Why don't college players do it if NIL comes through? They won't own them either? Right. Same thing goes for high schoolers. Seriously? Yeah, this is why I wanted to take this question. Okay. So Explain. you actually don't own your high school highlight film. Um, or at least not, not your high school film. Now your high school may in your uniform you... with your like, yeah, yep, exactly. So here's, here's how this works. You typically have a filmer for your high school. A lot of times it's, it's, it's like a volunteer who you know, probably gets paid a little bit to, to film the high school game. The high school then typically sells that or trades that film to, you know, huddle or another, you know, fil film company, Verge or, you know, whatever, like elite scouting down in South Florida. I, I don't know if you, if you know, uh, if you know Fish or not down there, Danny, but like, you know, he, he does a lot of the games in like, you know, Miami Dade, Broward area. Um, and so it's a good trade for the high school because a lot of times they'll make a little bit of money on it. Uh, and, or sometimes the high schools even pay to have somebody come and film, chop it all up, all, all that kind of stuff right? The high schools usually aren't making a whole lot of actual cash on it, if at all, but like they're getting, you know, they're getting value in terms of trade and then they get a, a way to showcase their players, you know, via huddle or, or via another, you know, another app. And, and those guys can then use that, that created highlight, you know, via the software that huddle provides them to send out to schools and schools can, can find the clips on them as well as, as the whole games. So if this ever got big enough, to where like you could actually make a lot of money on your highlights. Technically you don't own those rights because you are not the filmer or the person contracting to, to do the filming. Um, I would be interested if high schools actually have agreements that says like somebody else can't film you, right? Like if you're a parent filming, that's what I'll, like if, stands, yeah. if your dad, cell phone right there, yeah. boom. Like, yeah, right. So you may be able to create create like like an old school NFT moment. In fact, I think that'd be pretty cool. Like if you had old school highlights of some of these guys that you shot as a photographer, you know, you could maybe create an NFT, you know, down the line. Um, but yeah, I just thought it was interesting that I don't know how many people realize like you actually don't own, own the highlights. Now, if you create the highlight yourself, you depending on what software you use and the rights you had to the, to the initial footage, you may be able to claim rights on it based on you know, some sort of creative product, right? Like what makes this unique is the way I cut the highlight and all that kind of stuff. Just because you're the guy in the highlight does not mean that you actually own the film at all. Well, there's also, and I don't know how it works at high school. There's probably not as big of a deal, but if you're going to post a highlight in a college uniform or an NFL uniform, you have to pay the NFL. I don't know if you have to pay the school, but like to show the logo. Like, I mean, right. if Clemson owns their logo, if you're in a Clemson jersey, they're going to say, Hey, that's, that's ours. Like you can't now, if you're doing, I think like it's such a Pandora's box of questions that this just opens up that we have no idea how it's going to work because how many viral videos have we seen of some kicker doing trick shots with his kicking out in a t-shirt and shorts on the field or a football player doing a dunk or a, uh, you know, a football player going through his workouts. Like maybe there's opportunity there, but we just have no idea what it's going to be. But I feel like you have to, and I, somebody will take advantage of it for sure. We you start your own YouTube channel, put your name on it and you start doing videos. And if you're good enough, people will click on those. So you could monetize them. And then I think where it does get interesting is what the question proposed is what if the team does kind of feed into that? And there's going to be so many, it's just going to be the wild, wild West. And the, Football programs for a long time have found a way to skirt the rules that are there. And this will be like all the rest of them. Somebody's going to find an angle of how to take advantage of it at some point. But if I do not believe uh, the money that you could make, like in your, you start a YouTube channel and you sign up for the monetize options. Yep. I don't know if the money that you could make from that is super significant even it is not if, yes right unless right. you're zion williamson i uh, pulled up our cover three numbers right now and uh <laughs> we, we, we we put out content every single day um but if you're i think there are we could go to lunch select, on this yeah hey, i think right. there are i think there are a select handful of players that you'll see once every few years like zion i think if you know trevor lawrence justin fields possibly but again 
It's got to be. Now, Zion was unique because he could go out and just do dunks in some pickup game that he's wearing a T-shirt, and he could monetize those. Right. Like, you're not going to be posting too much. Well, and that's the thing. I don't know if you're doing high school video, but are you, cre- are you creating enough of it where people are coming and routinely getting? Because I don't even know if Zion had his own YouTube channel. I mean, it was off his Instagram, which – that's a whole nother avenue of where you could monetize it. Like, can you put it on your Instagram page? Like, it's just, it's going to be crazy. But I, I'm with you. I, I'm with you guys. I don't think the money will be as big as some people make it out to be. But we're about to find out. There's a, there's a lot of numbers that were run on, based on college athletes' Instagram pages and based on the, uh, the market averages for, uh, cost per impression, um, like trying to say like they, like they could make this much money. Mm. I understand those. And those are good pieces of data to understand that there is an opportunity to make those that money, but the market also changes the second that companies are allowed to get out there and they don't, there is not enough money from the companies that want to spend that money to actually pay all of these athletes, what the industry standard is for their Instagram pages. They're just not going to be interested in uh, linking themselves up with that many players. And so it's a, it's an interesting topic and thank you, bud. I had no idea that uh, like high school film had ownership like that. Oh yeah. That, um, that article that you're referencing, I got into it with the company that projected those numbers you know, because it was Paige on Beckers Twitter. was at the top. Yeah, on Twitter. I actually have the CEO of this Open Doors company coming on my radio show tomorrow Ooh. because we got into it. And there are a couple guys that played football at Nebraska. And they 10 years ago, they started a company to try to capitalize it. So they have an interest in these numbers, too. Yeah. And I went and looked at their website. <clears throat> they have you can pay them a service and then they help monetize your Instagram you know, posts. And, yeah, I think Paige Beckers, you know, player of the year in women's basketball. I think she could probably make some decent amount of money. She has 730,000 followers on Instagram. ESPN is plastered all over the place. She's got a brand where I think she could make some money. How much? I don't know. Um, I don't know if I could say the same of Haley Van Lith, who's a guard at Louisville, who has almost 700,000 No, I think she can make some money. There's- so how much? Because the, the estimation on here was a million dollars. Oh, I don't know about that. But like uh- – I think Danny brings up a good point, and I got to say this in a certain way. Your marketability is absolutely not tied to how good you are. Right. Like Paige is a much better player than Haley, right? Right. Well, they have the same practice, amount of followers for a reason. Looks matter. Right. right. And also, according to this, the markets matter. But I don't understand. Like Louisville, I guess, bigger market. I don't, Just some of these numbers. I'll get, those were the top two potential earners. Jalen Suggs. How many people across America a month ago could have told you who Jalen Suggs was? I don't think it's that many. I think basketball fans could have, but like, I don't think it's the same as saying Tre- uh, Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields. Like, I don't think there's any way that Jalen Suggs, now maybe after this month he could have because he had an incredible run and one of the greatest shots in the history of college basketball. But before that, I don't think he's making half a million dollars based on his Instagram followers. You know, now, I'm going to kill this guy tomorrow, so I'm going to find out where these numbers are coming from. And he has this algorithm, and he says, hey, there was these other athletes that have done it before, but I think those are the one-offs, and those are the 1%, which ironically, the 1% in college athletics are the ones that are going to be millionaires anyway. Right. So I looked at those and I was like, okay, I understand the numbers that you used and plugged into your algorithm. But I'm saying if you take that to market, not every single player is going to deliver to expectation. Right. right. And where I've come around, and that's what I hope. I think a lot of players are like, yeah, we're going about to get paid. We're about to be rich. I just want to be honest about the numbers so that the players' hopes aren't crushed when they get there. Because well, our and, honesty and is we I've, don't know. Are right, the we don't. We, we don't. don't. We don't. And if it's only a couple thousand bucks, great like that's good a, a couple thousand bucks could make a world of difference to a lot of kids in college i know it would have to me i would have felt like hit the lottery are you kidding me and you know i came from a pretty good background but i think it's it's that and that's where i've kind of grown up. all right so it's a couple thousand bucks it's not that big a deal did y'all ever uh, sell books before the semester was over oh my goodness are you kidding me <laughs> I, I and we used to get so this was the racket which is probably illegal And I definitely could have gotten in trouble for it, but that was cash. You get cash from the bookstore because we got our books for free and books were expensive. 
Remember how expensive books were? Mm -hmm. Take them into the bookstore and walk away with three or 400 bucks cash. It was mm -hmm. a racket. It was awesome. I don't think yeah. I learned about it till later, like my junior year, which was yeah. stupid. That was the, uh, the, the, cause the first one would be like, after I would drop a class, like you sign up for five, <laughs> knowing that you were going to end up dropping one. So then you go and sell all those books. Then maybe you like, you're, you're in a class that is, is, has five books. You finish one, you go and sell it. And then you're in a class, you're like, man, I'm going to fail this class and it's too late to drop it. Well, let's just sell the books and here's $90. Let's go out for the weekend. <laughs> Love I that know. university. Now nobody Carolina even uses books though. Um, all right. Uh, next question comes from Jack. Love the pod, except for the fact that I bet on all of your losing picks. <laughs> the syndicate was profitable on the season. Not mine and Barton's. Mine, Barton and I crushed it. Hey. Just follow, follow along me. the X players. Follow, <laughs> follow me for bowl season. When things get more chaotic, I thrive. Huge Texas A&M fan and have been attending games since I was in the womb back in 1996. Jack's a young buck. Uh, time and time again, this pod has said that Texas A&M and Notre Dame were basically the same team in 2020, and I wholeheartedly agree. I've got two questions building off this. Number one, Kellen Mond is consistently seen as a higher draft prospect than Ian Book, even though I think they're basically the same quarterback. Who is the better quarterback, and who would you draft, one or neither? Also, is Texas A&M destined for the same postseason success as Notre Dame if parentheses big if we keep up this level of success is our ceiling going 11 and one with the loss to Bama maybe make the playoffs only to be embarrassed at the nation's highest level mm. let me get to the Ian book Kellen Mond comp because that's pretty interesting when you look at those two paired against again uh, one another um I liked Ian book I thought he was sneaky underrated I thought he got better but Kellen Mond, I do think the system that he played in, the improvements he made, um, the arm strength overall, I do think he's better. So I would probably take a flyer on Kellen Mond ahead of Ian Book. The thing is, you're not at, like, if you're an NFL team, you're not going to be inserting the Notre Dame version of Ian Book or the Texas A&M version of Kellen Mond into a game. You are trying to bet on upside. And that's why teams like like Kellen Mond a lot better because they feel like he has some physical potential that could translate it into higher production if they can unlock that. Right? That's what coaches do. They see tools and they they want to try to, to you know get it out of you. Nobody wants to go coach a guy who's already maxed out. You know? Yeah. Like, I was, unless unless he's Tom Brady, and then you know. I was going to say, is it like Kellen Mond? We have to look at his production, knowing that he was within the Jimbo Fisher, Texas A&M offense and guess that there's more Then look at Ian book and think that, man, Tommy Reese did a great job of getting the most out of him during that 2020 season. I mean, there was a four to five game stretch in the middle of last year, like the Clemson game being one of them where Ian book was playing some of the best football of his career. And that's where you'd like, you know, credit Ian book and the work that he put in to be able to get himself better, but also maybe credit Brian Kelly and, uh, and Tommy Reese for being able to, find a ways within that offense an offense that as we mentioned on the spring cleaning episode earlier this week did not have outside receivers and was very very limited in what it could do uh i i, I could understand why it's mond over book but uh i might be on the neither if i'm given that option i think a flyer on kellen mond later is not a bad option i wouldn't like I, I, I that's almost some of these quarterbacks the way we're so over hyping these top four or five quarterbacks I'd almost be rather somebody picking in the third round and saying, let me get somebody like a Kellen Mond, like a Kyle Trask, and, or, you know, like Sam Ellinger even potentially, although I think he's more of a long shot. But let me just see if I can develop him, give him some time, give him a breather. I don't have to back up the bank, and let's see if this works. You know, like a Dak, and maybe you get luck into a Dak Prescott situation. What do you, just, I, so by what the way, the do you know the size differential in Ian Book and Kellen Mond? I was looking that up while we were talking. I thought they were similar. Mon's pretty big in person. I, I did not realize that. He's 6'3", and Book only six feet tall. So there's a three-inch differential. And that 6'3 is probably legit. Like that, yes. I would oh, yeah, guess, this is like, off the NFL yeah. stuff. So this isn't like a wiki or Texas A&M site and Notre Dame site. Oh, um, you mean like how Zach Wilson is as tall as Justin Fields, if you believe BYU's uh, <laughs> yeah. roster? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Somebody on Twitter brought up a good point. Um, 
if Purdue gave Rondell Moore two extra inches, do we also think they gave, uh, was it David Bell two extra inches? Mm. Mm. And then like, I know, think everybody, you, if they're all, do, if one guy's doing it, they're all doing it for sure at that program. So I'm sure NFL teams know which schools do it, which don't. Which well, see, that's uh, what the about disadvantage the of the combine, no combine. You know, that's right. the fact. That's what's killing them too. What about the programs? Texas A&M, Notre Dame. We said they were the same team in 2020. Are they the same program? Let's say what, immediate future? Mm. I think A&M, because of who they can recruit, right, and get into their school, has a larger kind of margin for error because they can they can just simply get more of these defensive line difference makers into school academically than, than, than the Irish can, right? I think they both are a quarterback away from being a like truly special team, but I think AM's floor might be higher just because of, of the amount of talent they can amass on defense. And and there's just not enough guys who are, are that great, you know, talent wise on the defensive line who also have the academics to get into Notre Dame. Um, it- AM can, can get a lot more in. Is it that much different than the discussion we were just having about the quarterbacks? Right. Like, not really. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, they've maximized, and that's its credit to Brian Kelly too, that he has maximized the talent that he's given. And Jimbo's just starting to get in more of this talent, with more raw potential. And so I would feel, but I'll, although if you could put the whole thing together, Texas A&M has to go through Bama. They got to go through LSU. They got to go through Auburn. You know, Notre Dame doesn't. So but I would say I'm, I'm more bullish on Texas A&M's talent level and the ability to separate and compete against Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State than I am with Notre Dame. Yeah, I think level of play, edge A&M. Record, mm-hmm. not necessarily due to who you right. play. Yeah. So, Brian Kelly, we would say that really this last little run is the is, – is real, is, is, as, as much as he could do. Like, he's built to this point. He's had to reload. He's had to change out some coaches. He's had to change a strength and conditioning program. He's, he seems to be maximizing things right now. Took him about eight seasons to Unless get there. he gets a QB. Yeah. But I was just thinking for Jimbo Fisher, where you're saying things are just getting started, If that's why you give him the long contract. That's why you hope, as a Texas A&M fan, that uh, – price of oil stays good and that Jimbo Fisher is ready to go when Nick Saban retires, because that's, that's what you're investing in is that he's got that thing up and running so that it's uh, it's ready to go when it's time. All right. One more longtime listener of the pod, undoubtedly one of the best college football podcasts out there. All of you guys, including hashtag Barton are <laughs> hashtag RIP Barton. He's not dead. Hashtag anchor down are truly the best and a sincere thank you to all the amazing content you put out. It literally makes my days better. My question is, I'm a huge college football junkie and love all things college football. Go blue. But I want to learn more about the true X's and O's of the game. I obviously understand the basics, but I'm interested in learning more about the strategy. I'm talking about offensive and defensive formations, coverage schemes, pass protections. What really is an air raid offense? What's the difference between cover two and cover three? Hey, that's the name of the podcast. All that good stuff. I'm not trying to be a coach or anything, but I want to take a deeper dive into learning the game and have something to think about as I watch the games on my couch with a beer. Drink it, make it a course like. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who wants to learn the, the game more? What did each of you do, you do to learn? I think I know Danny's answer. Are there any resources out there, websites, books, videos that you would recommend? Thanks so much. Well, the obvious answer is go play in the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> I just, he's got off to the right start. He's listening to the Cover Three podcast, right? Yeah. I mean, there are plenty of resources out there. There's some. I mean, there's some guys that have gotten starts in this business that are making a living off of, you know, evaluating talent, analyzing games, breaking down film, and they started doing it on social media and putting it out there. And now they have jobs. I mean, Daniel Jeremiah is a pretty good example. Who's the lead, you know, NFL draft guy for the NFL network does a fantastic job. I mean, there's a bunch of examples like that. So I think it's kind of just looking around and finding the right people to listen to. Cause there's a lot of entertaining podcasts, but if you want to get deeper into the weeds, so to speak, there are resources out there. You just have to dig for them somewhat. Yeah. I, I would attend, say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Danny. Can you attend any of the, I know they have a lot of coaches clinics. Yeah. I was going to say that I, I I do go. Um, That's what I did. And anybody can attend, right? Yeah. Um, 
yeah, like you can basically go to anything you want. I mean, it's not free, but like, obviously like, like you, you your high school usually pays for it. If you're, if you're a high school coach, um, just go to like, I know they have the, the Glazier clinics and then like the Nike coach of the year clinics, just look for those when, when they come to your town this year, they were all zoom based. So you can actually, uh, for a pretty reasonable fee, you, you can pay and get access to all those clinics. I, I know I have the, uh, the Kirby smart one, uh, bookmarked, uh, to you know, talk about some of his secondary adjustments those are going to be a little bit advanced for you. Right. I, I would say, so like, if, you, if you're just starting, like, like the questioner wanted to know what's the difference between cover two and cover three, he doesn't want to know, like, how do we tag cloud? So, so, so we don't get hit with the post, right? Like, you know, that, that, that type of stuff. So I would say, actually, that's not a great example, but uh, go to smartfootball.com. It's, it's a, it's like an old school, like blogosphere site started in probably like 07 or 08. Chris Brown started that. Um, that was, a pretty good resource back in the day. If you wanted to know some things like that, just real basic. And I would start back from his, you know, some of his first posts. There's a ton of stuff on YouTube, by the way, like you can see it in motion that they'll kind of teach you the, the basics on it. Um, you can get up to speed pretty quickly. Yeah. I was going to say podcasts aren't going to be it. You got to be able to have yeah. your eyes to be able to see it, whether it's uh, besides uh, cover three. <laughs> I Whether mean, don't you remember the outstanding uh, <laughs> diagram of umbrella coverage? I mean, that's that right. Was- that was epic. I mean, you don't find that anywhere else except for the Cover 3 pod. YouTube.com slash Cover 3. All Cover 3 episodes available uh, for multi-platform excellence uh, all through the CBS Sports app as well. I um, I got hired by CBS in 2010. Uh and I'd been writing for a college sports website, but kind of had been mostly college basketball leaning. Like it was probably more college basketball than college football. I linked up with uh, our friend, Michael Felder, and just went to those coach of the year clinics, sat in there. And I would be like, what is this? What is this? What is this? And he was just able to like translate the coach speak. And because I'm on the Nike coach of the year list, I still get a bunch of the videos emailed. You can buy the books that also have the entire uh, breakdowns with uh, like little X's and O's and charts. So coaching clinics to answer the part of how did you do it? Coaching clinics. I listened to coaches, talk to coaches about what they're doing. And it was like, uh, you know, Mark D'Antonio, it was Mac Brown. It was, it was like big time power five coaches that were up there being able to break it all down. Nick Saban always does it. Kirby smart does it. Uh, it, it is a, a little bit tough sometimes to translate, but in the same way, like when you go to a foreign country, if you know a few of those words, like you can be like, okay, I recognize a few of those. Let's use context clues and let's try to put it together. And eventually you end up being a little bit better. And even still, I'm, I'm, I'm not great. I've never claimed it to be my expertise, but uh, that little bit helped lay some foundation that has helped me watch the game with different eyes. And when I'm listening to smarter people, like the two people here talk about it, I'm at least able to, uh, to check in and understand kind of what's going on. So Chip, let me ask you this. If you didn't have Mike there, by the way, shout out Felder. Um, if you didn't have him with you there at those clinics, do you feel like you would have been swimming too much? You see what I'm saying? Like, like I, I, before I go to those, I would, I would watch some basic YouTube videos. Yes. So you like, you understand what different coverages are. Cause like the clinics for the most part are going to be how to play certain coverages, like the, the intricacies of them, right? Or like like how to adapt them to certain offenses. Like if you don't know at least the base stuff, so I would I would just you know go on YouTube or or you know go on Smart Football or I know Chris has a book that actually explains it all. If you want a little hard copy to read by the pool this summer, um, it's like maybe a hundred pages paperback. It's a, yeah, right. yeah, definitely yeah. Get, get get. I've got Chris's book too, and I, I read SmartFootball.com going into it. And to answer your question, yeah, if I didn't have Felder there. Uh, I would have gotten probably 40% of what I was able to take away. Um, and probably the rest would have been like, you know, they get up there and they've got their charts. Like, these are our program principles. Number one, oh we're about toughness. <laughs> we're about education. <laughs> like, I got a good Chad Morris story from the oh, yeah? coaching clinic. Yeah. So he was talking about, I think this is when he got to SMU and they were really, really bad. Right. Um, and he was talking about how, and this is back when Chad Morris was, you know, still kind of a rising star. He's actually the head coach at Allen football now uh, in mm-hmm. the high school ranks again. But he was talking about how to get a win, right? He's like, we want to find a win every single day. Like, let's let's work on setting goals and accomplishing those goals. And uh, and they were they were struggling at, at SMU. And he's telling this to the whole room, so I'm cool with sharing this now. And he's like, Coach, what's our goal going to be? He's like. 
and one of the assistant coach goes, I, I want everybody's helmet to be facing the same way in stretch line. And Chad Morris is like, that's our goal. <laughs> like that's, that's where we're at here. We're starting to see He's like, all right. Okay. I'm gonna be excited about this. All right, guys, everybody. Great job. Everybody has their helmets facing the right way in stretch. We are together as one team. He's like, guys, it's just that simple, right? You start small with the goals. Everybody feels that collective buy-in. They're operating as a team. Nobody's you know, being an individual with their helmet facing side. It's like, wow. But yeah, they, you do get some of that stuff there. Yeah, good stuff. I also got Tom Herman to tell me uh, like basically what their game plan was when he was at Houston against Louisville. Remember when Louisville had Lamar Jackson and they beat them? Yeah, that, yeah. that was when – yo, go ahead. No, he was like, look, we, we didn't really want to run hurry up because that means Lamar gets the ball more. But we also thought that some of the defensive calls for Louisville and Grantham was the, the DC at Louisville at the time took too long to get in. So what we did was we raced up to the line so that they had to kind of stay in simpler calls. And then we, we made our, our call at the last second just to milk the clock. Cause we weren't trying to, you know, give Lamar Jackson the ball 15, 16 times in a game. Didn't you have it Oliver too? He did. That was, yeah. that was, useful. that probably helped the yeah. calling as well. <laughs> Yeah, that team beat Oklahoma and Louisville, both and top they, five opponents, and lost to Navy, yes. SMU, and Memphis. They had every chance to win, be the group of five team. They had it set up perfectly. Yeah. They went to Annapolis as the number six team in the country. They were on the mothership CBS Sports Network and lost 46 to 40. Mm. Mm. Chip, mm. Live, live odds on the, uh, on the Masters cut just went to plus three. Oh, hey, so what's, today. what's our, uh, what's the, the, I saw the prop for the high score was over under 84 and a half and, uh, Ooh. Sandy Lyle got off to like a plus six or plus seven through <laughs> so long right? plus eight through 12. Okay. That's, yeah. that's what we're dealing with. Well, and remember, uh, CBS sports.com, the CBS sports mobile app, Paramount plus, to stream every single bit of the Masters coverage, CBS Sports HQ for all your updates. Uh, it'll be going all through the weekend. You can follow him on Twitter at Danny Cannell. You can follow him at Bud Elliott 3 You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. 